Welcome to another episode of the PNR Churchman. I'm with ruling elder Bob Allen. Now, Bob has been a friend online for, I would say, a few years now, but uh, I'm just fascinated by uh, what he does and his background. And so this conversation is going to go in a lot of different directions. Uh, Bob is, like I said, he's a ruling elder, obviously, but he worked at Coral Ridge uh, Church down there in South Florida. And uh all in their media work and all that. And we're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about his work with NRB TV and uh, what he's done with on the production side. And uh, I guess you're an interviewer too. So I don't, I don't even, I can't even get clear everything (laughs) you've done and do. So why don't you introduce yourself? Tell us where you are now, what church you serve at, how long you've been a ruling elder. And then we'll, we'll just get into the discussion, Bob. Thanks. Yeah. First of all, it's really unfair because I'm always in that chair. I, this is a very <laughs> uncomfortable place for me. And uh, I've always looked at my life and careers. I'm a picture frame. I'm always pointing to and highlighting that which should be the focus. And that's worked both as a co-host on on broadcast, but also, I mean, we should all be picture frames for Christ and not intruding ourselves into the picture because he's the only worth one worth looking at. But, uh, okay. Amen. I'm at, I'm at Hickory Grove church in, uh, just on the east side of Nashville. And, uh, I've been in the church about 20 years and probably been a ruling elder. I'd have to look it up, but probably around 18 years, maybe 19. Um, and so I work with, uh, we just got a, a uh, relatively new pastor now. It's almost two years ago, but uh, he's just such a wonderful fit and a blessing to us. And and the Lord is uh, giving us all kinds of growth at this moment that we haven't seen. So it's a, it's just a great time to be at Hickory Grove. Great, great. So you became a ruling elder at that church then, if I understand the timeline right. I did. I I was uh, I asked the wrong questions at a previous church when uh, I was interviewed to be one. You know, like uh, they had questions on the questionnaire, like you know, have you ever owned your own business? Have you been in the military? And and I had the audacity to say, where do I find those in scripture? What does that have to do with the qualifications for an elder? That didn't go over so well, so I ended up back on the diaconate. Well, hey, the diaconate's uh, called office also. So, oh, absolutely. Uh, okay, yeah, I can see. And this I was chair at Coral Ridge, so I mean, I was chair at Coral Ridge for four years and led the meetings. So, uh, I, I'd been on the diaconate before. See, I knew I was going to learn something. So, you you were on the uh, diaconate at Coral Ridge in South Florida. That is correct. Yeah, yeah. We had about well, forty some deacons. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. Wow. How? So, what year was that? Um, that probably would have been 1989 or 90 when that started. Wow. So let, let's, let's jump in there. We're going to talk Coral Ridge. Obviously you do a lot in media and production and I really was expecting a better backdrop than a, than a green screen. Um, Bob, Sorry. But, <laughs> it's okay. I know. Uh, but, um, let, let's jump in at, on, about Coral Ridge. So, in the in the late eighties, at what phase of ministry was it for the church? Because I know it had gone through different phases and it had gone through different growth patterns. Like, what would you? How would you describe it when you came into it in the eighties? I mean, it was kind of the heyday. Um, although when I was going down there in the late nineteen eighties, I arrived in the early part of nineteen eighty eight. It was right in the milieu of the Jim Baker, Jimmy Swaggart time of our culture. And so uh, I remember speaking with my wife and saying, you know, do we really want to go work with a televangelist at this <laughs> point? Because of what was happening in the broader culture as that came to. But the more I studied uh, Dr. Kennedy and his work, I thought, no, this is a good place to be at that time. And uh, that was also the first Presbyterian church that I'd ever been in. Um, I grew up, uh, my family was a church going family. And we were, uh, for the most part, in the Evangelical Free Church out in California. And, uh, in fact, our pastor was Paul Cedar, who became the president of the, the Evangelical Free Church in later years. So um, a really good, solid church. But And I don't want to get into necessarily, unless you want to, the family breakup and all those things, which kind of shattered things in my home life growing up. But uh, so that that was my background. And, in fact, um it was when I was in at a radio network and station in Los Angeles that my boss gave me Chosen by God by R.C. Sproul. And that was my first introduction to Reformed theology. And it was like, 
I just read the Bible, read the Bible, read the Bible, and and all of a sudden it was like, oh, this finally makes sense of so many things, and it it launched me off into that. And in fact, one of the funny things is too that my boss got me to go to a prospective students conference down at Westminster West, and uh, one of my first meetings with a student, he was talking, oh, you know, tell me about it. Oh, you know, evangelical preachers. He goes, well, that's not reformed, is it? And I'm like, what's reformed? That's where I was at that time. And so, uh, you know, when I went to Coral Ridge in 1988, I was pretty much, I didn't know the lingo. Uh, it was just a really high growth time for me. So, wow. Right. So, so when you went, would you say like Coral Ridge was a distinctly reformed church? Did you, did you associate it with, with broad evangelicalism? You mentioned the televangelist stuff. And so there's, um, there, there's obviously those, overlaps and so what uh how how would did you view the church at that point <laughs> well at that point i wasn't smart enough to view it in the way that i can now um i would look back and say you know uh, dr kennedy very intentionally kept sunday mornings broadly evangelical because of who was watching that service all across the ah. nation and around the world um sunday nights he was much more intentionally reformed in his bible teaching um, and so that was just the way he set it up based on his view of ministry and how media ministry should be used. That's really interesting. Okay. So when you, when you went to Coral Ridge, what did you go that you went there for a job? I, they hired me to be the radio producer and, uh, I came in and, and actually took over what four different people had been doing and, and piled that all into my job. And basically for eight years or so on site, um, I was all things radio. And so, uh, we had the, uh, the daily program, the daily half hour, a weekly half hour. We had short features, all kinds of different things. But if it was radio, I was involved, um, and television as well. I wasn't necessarily involved in the day to day or the production aspects other than I was the voice of the ministry on both radio and TV. And so, and that continued for about 30 years. So even after I left the site down there, I was still working for them and producing from, uh, from afar. What, wait a minute. What does the voice of the ministry mean? What, what you did the intros and the just, yeah, I'm, I'm, as I said, the picture frame, I'm the one who's setting the, the stage to basically say, this is what's coming and here it is. So it was just to get to set the stage for the listener or the viewer to know what was coming. And that was different in the roles for, for radio and television. I mean, television, it was much more of just an announcer role on radio. A little bit of the personality got into it just because I was the co-host on the air with Dr. Kennedy. I would interview him and and so I, I was a little bit more of me on the radio not too much would, more <laughs> would you say you got to know uh, dr kennedy well i i don't i think that that's that's a stretch i mean i got to spend more time with him um than people who had been there for decades because literally although you know many of the people on staff as i came to learn got very few times when they were face to face with him. I mean, it's a huge place. Um, but I got him in the studio every week. And so not only did we do the kind of things that were on the, the schedule for the day to be recorded, but you know, we'd have conversations here or there. And so, you know, it was a really privileged uh, throughout my life and career. I've been privileged to, to be with some of the great Christian uh, communicators and thinkers of our age. And, uh, and that was just one of those times when it, it, there was a little more of a relationship there than most people who'd been there for decades. And I, I found that out as some of them kind of were, uh, they would admit later that they kind of envied the fact that I got more time with him than almost anybody. I bet. I bet. that That's great. So how large was the church in the late eighties, early nineties? That's a good question. I mean, the official numbers I think were larger. I think, you know, as far as weekly attendance goes, it was probably in the four to 5,000 range. That would be my guess. Um, but I could be wildly wrong because I'm going okay. by recollection. Right, right. And so I was, uh, so let me see, in the 90s, I was in high school and college. So oh, stop. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, not, not walking with the Lord, not, I wouldn't have had a clue what Reformed theology was or confessionalism or, or any of those, those categories. When I did uh, come to the Lord and, and then become Reformed, I was aware of, of Dr. Kennedy. And, and I was in South Florida. I was in Hollywood, Florida. Hmm. Uh, actually, the church, I don't know. You, you must know the churches down there. I was at St. Andrews 
uh, yeah. Presbyterian Church in Hollywood. Yeah. yeah. And uh, Pastor T.J. Campo is still there. He was probably there when, when you were. But uh, anyway, um, but at that point, w- when did Dr. Kennedy pass away? Uh, if I remember correctly, it was 2007. Right, right. And that's right when I was getting into, like, I think my first Ligon Ear conference was, was 08. And so I didn't have any real overlap with uh, Dr. Kennedy, but I was fascinated by his ministry model. And I think it, it's a model that seems to be, it, it's receiving a lot of questions and maybe going away now. But in the context of the the time, I mean, what my understanding was he wanted his own, not his own, forgive me, the, for the for the church and Coral Ridge, a, a school, a radio station, a television ministry, an evangelism ministry, and a seminary. And I guess the seminary was the last piece of that when they when Knox Theological Seminary was was formed, and that's where I did my um, my MDiv. So that's where yeah. you know. So I, I knew some of that, but uh, I mean Westminster. Uh, I forget what the school's called. Westminster Westminster Christian Academy. Westminster Academy. Yeah, right, right. I mean that that school is uh, it's a great school. I, I have yeah. a lot of friends that have gone there, and and um, that I guess that was that's pre K through twelve, and so he. But he had, he he kind of had that empire, you know. I don't know if he would call it an empire, and I don't know if that's frowned upon. But in other words, media, and then of course evangelism explosion, and that that's still going strong today. And so, what are some since you had an inside look at at a lot of that developing? What was his viewpoint on on that? Those different sort of streams or strands or, or departments of the the ministry. Well, I mean, he obviously had a very comprehensive Christian worldview about the impact that Christ should be having in every area of life and ministry. Mm. And so that's why all those things were outgrowths of that. But, you know, when it comes to, I mean, when most people think of him in the in the public sphere, they think of the media ministries because that was the biggest exposure that he probably had with a lot of people. But I remember one of the times in the in the last year, probably, that I was uh, there, I did a, an actual half-hour interview with him, just more or less about James Kennedy uh, than a lot of things. And and I, I asked him, I said, you know, when when people look back at your legacy, what is it that you would prefer them to think of. And I said, I know a lot of people are going to think of media ministry, but as if I know your heart, you want to be known for evangelism explosion. And he just lit up because that was who Jim Kennedy was. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, if I can go back, uh, one of the first times that I uh, spent time outside of the ministry and outside the studio, we went to the National Religious Broadcasters Convention in 1989, January, Washington, D.C., and at that time, uh, the ministry was rather large. We had a contingent that was there that was sizable. And on the way back from the hotel to the airport, and we all lined up, you know, this whole groups who were getting in cabs to go back to the airport. And somehow I got chosen that I was going to be in the cab with Jim and Ann Kennedy. And I was excited beyond anything because I knew even at that time I had been there less than a year, but I knew his reputation and I knew what was going to happen. And sure enough, Jim got in the front with the cabbie and Ann and I were in the back. And so I was ready to, you know, get him, get him, get him kind of thing. And he began and he started to talk to the cab driver and he learned who he was and he was relatively new to the country from Egypt. He was Muslim. And he just continued this conversation, learning about the man, learning about his family and all this. And meanwhile, I'm watching signs and going, well, the airport's coming up pretty fast. When, when's he going to get him? When's he going to get him? <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and I thought he's not going to have enough time. You know, we're getting off the, the road. We're getting to the airport. But, uh, you know, oh, me of little faith and understanding. He was demonstrating, and, and not that he was doing it for me, but he was demonstrating something that he, that I would learn when I actually went through EE, and that is earning the right to be heard. Uh, he was showing that he cared about this man as a man before he then did get into, make a gospel presentation to him, leave him something to think about, seeds, and, you know, uh, gave him, I believe, you know, one of his books as a, as a something to carry on. 
but that was who Jim Kennedy was. And that was to me, um, you know, the lights weren't the big thing, the camera. It was being able to spend time with him in one of his favorite restaurants in Fort Lauderdale and seeing him again, earn the right to be heard with the waitress and kind of starting with her. And then the next time she visit, getting another piece in. And then the next time, and basically getting then through a gospel presentation while you're eating lunch. Um, mm. Everywhere he went, cabs, hotels, on the streets, in people's homes, in restaurants, that was who Jim Kennedy was. He was introducing people to Jesus wherever he went. And that, to me, was his most enduring legacy. And, and you know, again, that was what brought him the most joy um, when I asked him about it. But uh, that, that, that was probably the best thing, too, was being able to spend time seeing him present the gospel in all those different contexts. It's just what his heart beat with. So would you say, then, if, if sharing the gospel and, and sharing the gospel, sharing Christ— was central to his life that all these other outworkings, whether it be TV, radio, grammar school, high school, was all to that end? Was that how he viewed th these are different ways to launch that? Well, I mean, I, I think he would say that they wouldn't be worth anything if that wasn't the core. I mean, mm. having a school just for education and in secular topics, I mean, he would have had no interest in that. Um, you know, some of the things... It, <sighs> You know, how deep do I go into it? But when you get into things like media ministry, that's where uh, marketing rears its head. And a lot of what was presented on television was not really reflective of his heartbeat. It mm -hmm. was what those he entrusted with that side of the professional world. It, it, he let them kind of drive the train on what subjects were talked about a lot. Um, and they were the ones who dictated that. Um, some of those involved were ones that were like, you know, they, they shoot us away even on radio from dealing with some of the more strongly reformed topics because, well, that, that would, you know, maybe not bring in the same kind of response. And that's just one of those balance things that you kind of have to, to play off of. But again, it, it, the gospel was the root of everything the man did. The reason he started in media is because, uh, you may have heard the story about how, you know, it was Donald Gray Barnhouse on the radio that was, it popped on in the radio after a night of drinking and carousing. And, you know, Barnhouse is going, young man, what would you say if you stood before God? And he said, why should I let you into my heaven? And that was, of course, the question that became a part of EE. That there was right. one of the root two questions. But that was what got Kennedy really thinking that was the seed that was planted that led to the gospel fruit in his life. And so when he became a pastor, he knew the power of media ministry and what it could do based on what it had done in his life. And so that's why he ended up using media the way that not, not a whole lot of people had done at that time, and especially not those in our theological circles. Right. Wow. So I didn't realize that. So that's one of the two diagnostic questions from EE, Evangelism Explosion. I was going to ask you to tell us both of them for our listeners that aren't familiar with EE. What uh, what are the two diagnostic questions? Well, it's if you were to stand before God and you were to say, why should, or excuse me, I got to go back now. I'm, I'm, I'm showing the rust. Um, if you were to die today, do you know for certain that you would be with God in heaven? That's number one. And then number two was, if you did stand before God and he said, why should I let you in? What would you say? Those are the two. Boy, I just blew that. <laughs> no. Well, it's funny that you're saying that because I was trying to remember them also. I mean, the, the one about, you know, if God said, why should I let you into my heaven is the one that we typically go to. But it's, uh, yeah, it's the, it's the first one. And so relevant today. I mean, he came up with that, and apparently now he he, uh, he they weren't original to him, obviously. Uh, we know that. But he directly got one of them from Barnhouse, you're saying. Yep. But um, still relevant today. And I know there's this thought today in a postmodern world that people aren't thinking about heaven and they're not thinking about these things. But and, and, and I get that to some extent, but those questions are still very relevant. I mean, Solomon writes, you know, that God has placed eternity on the hearts of man. And so they're easily adaptable to the larger. They're essentially what are the larger questions of life, you know, and uh, just a great launch points. But I love what you shared about 
you know, he really did care about the people to earn mm-hmm. the right to, uh, you know, r- relational capital, relational equity, even in short encounters, like in a cab. That's amazing. So what, um, okay. Do, do you know when evangelism explosion what started? I would have to look it up. I, I know it's been going a long, long time, and I know right. we celebrated some anniversaries while I was there, but I, I, I don't remember. It, it, I think it was in the 70s or 60s. I mean, it, it, it obviously was the thing that grew the church um, when it was in its first location over on Commercial Boulevard before it moved to the the new facility on uh, Federal Highway. But Actually, uh, I, 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 I forgot about this. Yeah, so my understanding is if you went to their church and filled out a visitor card, You'd get an EE visit to your to your that house. Right. How did that work? How did that work? Um, I mean, you know, I was a part of that. I was in several of the programs and became a teacher trainer, and and uh, so I mean, that was just and and here was again the beauty of it. Every time there was a class, and and when I was there, there were three classes: two in the evenings, one in the morning. And Dr. Kennedy was a part of every one of those classes, and wow. he was going out with trainees at least those three days a week at those times. And, uh, you know, I think that's always the challenge for a pastor, too, when you spin off certain ministries is, are you just spinning it off or are you actually leading it? And I think that was part of what was a tremendous success for E.E. was that he wasn't just promoting it, he was leading you into it. Um, but, yeah, just so many different examples. I mean, again, there's so so many stories. I remember times going out with him, and basically whenever you went out with him, he was going to be the one presenting. You knew that. So you were kind of just learning from the master at those times. But, uh, yeah, we visited people in their homes and had just remarkable encounters. You know, you, you have your own doubts, you know, over what's going to happen. But one of them that was most powerful in my mind, because there were times you'd go out and you'd think, man, I really nailed that presentation. And they had no interest at all. You know, you're kind of attributing it to your your eloquence or power. And it was like, no, ain't that. And there was one time, I remember, we went in and, and a man and a woman had just sat down to their dessert, their ice cream. And I thought, well, this isn't going to go well. And, they, you know, it turned over and I was the one to present. Well, I presented... And these people stopped eating their ice cream, and it just progressively, as I was going on, it just melted in their bowls into soup. That It was just a moment where the Spirit said, these people are ready, and I've made them ready. And the gospel presentation wasn't all that good from my end, but they both ended up saying they wanted to, to receive Christ. And Praise so, God. you know, the, the bottom line, and I think part of that, it's like everything else. We get so enamored with our wisdom. You talked about the questions and some people have said, oh, they don't really work with this generation. And I don't want to cast disrespect on Keller or anybody else who kind of questioned it. But the reality is, okay, who's doing the work? You know, anytime we start to think it's our knowledge, our eloquence, our planning, that's the primary factor, we're missing the boat. It's a matter of, you know, you can have the best gospel presentation in the world. If the Spirit hasn't prepared that heart, it ain't going anywhere. And you can do the worst one in the world. And if the Spirit's at work, then it doesn't matter how bad you botch it. Um, He's the one that's going to bring about. But are we out there spreading the seed is the question. Yeah. What's amazing about what you just shared is that I didn't know you were going to share that. I was going to share that because uh, and not... I mean, I didn't do those EE calls, but that seems to be the testimony of anybody that was a part of that ministry for any amount of time. It's almost, I, I do you, do you know Bob Barnes down at Sheridan? Uh, I know the Sheridan name Hillsman. and I, I think I've come across him, but Sher- Sheridan yeah. House Family Ministries, the director down there, yeah, he, he yeah. would, uh, he often would tell that story. Like they, they would go into EE calls and think, man, I nailed that presentation. You know, you got the five, the diagnostic questions, the five <laughs> points and, and boom, and then nothing. And then the times when you just feel like it's completely botched and you're like, well, that's not going to convince anybody of anything. The spirit uses it and and brings people. And I've heard that story so many times with EE visits, but what an amazing thing. So you're talking about a church of thousands of, of people and the senior pastor is training members on how to evangelize and then yep. going out and doing it with them. I mean, like, it's just, it's almost not, I don't know if, if, if that's even done anymore. Like there's this idea, partic- you know, of churches that are much smaller than thousands, but are considered medium sized churches that the senior pastor really doesn't have time to do that discipleship stuff. <laughs> 
and here he, I mean, it's like, what? It's just, it's very powerful. It's very convicting to me, by the way, as a senior pastor of a yeah. medium sized church here. Um, and, uh, I don't know. I don't know what to say about it. Praise God. I, it's it's and it's still going. I saw Rob, uh, the senior pastor there now, Rob Pacienza, uh, just had a did a e e e international evangelism explosion international. I don't know if they have some conference or something, and he was there, and so it's it's still going strong. So. Yeah, and the the fun thing about that story, it's a God story all the way. I think you probably know about Rob that back in the time when I was there in the early days, he was pulling cable for the TV ministry as just a young kid. Just a nobody. I wanted to. I, I didn't know that God part, but I did want to about. bring up. I want. Well, well. It's, so, I, I mean, Rob's a friend of mine. I could have him on, but I mean, to, but you know, this is part of the legacy, right? Because he went to Westminster Academy, mm-hmm. didn't he? Right. So, tell me, just tell me his his beginnings, Rob. You know, from what you know or whatever. I didn't know that about that, pulling cable. That's pretty much what I know. You know, he did work okay. for the ministry in the background. You know, pulling the cable before the Sunday service. But I mean, that was one of the things too that Jim Kennedy. He chose to spend his time in the ways that were very fruitful. I mean, you probably know, too, it's like a young teenager who grew up in South Florida and had all kinds of questions and was kind of, you know, wandering and lost was a guy named Albert Moeller. And it was Kennedy who, through apologetics, helped Moeller to to get a sure foundation under his faith. Uh, Moeller's wife was a Westminster Academy grad. And but if you talk to Al Moeller today, you know, he credits Jim Kennedy with the fact that he took time. I mean, this is a very busy man. You talked about the empire in human terms, but he took time for the things that mattered. And he was, he was really a mentor for Al Moeller. And I mean, look what Moeller's gone on to do um, since then. So, yeah. Wow. And that, there were lots is- of things that people didn't know until after he passed too, because there were, there were different things that Kennedy did with his personal money which he had sworn everybody to secrecy that no one could ever reveal what he was doing, but he was supporting people going into to seminary and ministry. And, you know, um, there was a very famous uh, uh, African who had been persecuted and, and brutalized, and he ended up here in this country, Gaetana and Gaetana. And he ended up going to seminary in the East Coast, and every, every semester he would go into the office and they'd say, your bill is paid. And he had no idea who it was that was, you know, doing this. Well, it was Jim Kennedy. And after he passed, then finally the story came out. But that was the kind of thing in that generation. I mean, I've heard stories, too, about Jerry Falwell and all. There were certain of those luminary figures that you just didn't realize what they were doing behind the scenes that was totally unknown. But you, when you come to learn about it, you think, man, these guys really walk the talk. Um, yeah. You know, they were well, here, just here, real. Here's here's another one, and I I mean again this is like it, it's like a uh, it becomes legendary or apocryphal or whatever <laughs> you want to say with but it was just I I know there was obviously you, you mentioned Falwell and Kennedy and Coleridge being associated with the religious right mm-hmm. and uh, there was a time where some gay rights activists were picketing outside the church and of course the media covers that this that and the other but what the media didn't show is. You know, I think people wanted to escort Kennedy out of the church, and rather than being escorted mm. out, he walked out on his own and started ministering and witnessing to one <laughs> to one of the protesters. Yeah. You know, but of course that's not that's not on TV. Uh, but yeah, it's um, but even as we t- we think about the religious right, and I'm I'm almost wondering if there was a convergence there because of the national, the media, the TV, the radio ministry. And it was interesting how you said right from the beginning of this discussion, how the Sunday morning, because that was filmed, that was, that took a little bit of a different flavor than, than the more distinctly reformed evening service that he would do. And I, I didn't, I never thought to think of it that way, but often when I hear about D James Kennedy and his legacy, it's like this galvanizing figure on the religious right or something. And like, is that his legacy? And and how did how do you think he viewed that? I think what's saddest about that is, as as we could expect with humans, is a lot of people took what he was saying and turned it into kind of a power centered thing. Um, when for him, again, if the gospel wasn't the root of the fruit that was coming, it wasn't going to work. 
Um, and so I think a lot of people, they just liked what he was saying, who were more conservatively politically oriented. And so they kind of just took that with the ball and run. But again, you take Jesus out of it. And for Jim Kennedy, it was like, it's going to fail. And and I think that's one thing about, again, the, the TV ministry, it would present the last chapter of applying the gospel in the culture. And what does that mean? But if you lost sight of the root that produce that, you were missing something. And I think that was part of why, you know, what got publicized may have led to the whole failure of the movement because it didn't have a root to sustain itself. And the fruit finally shriveled and died because people lost sight of the fact, if you don't have Jesus, none of this matters. Right, right. You know, I, so I read Christian Manifesto about three years ago. I I think I probably read it longer than that ago. But again, just to, I wanted to see, because I, I get fascinated with Francis Schaeffer because mm-hmm. on the one hand, he's this, he's like a hippie running a commune in Switzerland. <laughs> but on the other hand, he's the poster child for the religious right. And so everybody kind of claims him. And how did that work? You know? And so I read a bunch of his books recently and, and uh, how, how then shall we live or how shall we then live? And mm-hmm. then Christian Manifesto. And I was fascinated in Christian Manifesto that this is 1981, I think. And actually, he gave the talk at Coral Ridge, and you could see the YouTube video of it. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I produced it many times for air. <laughs> oh, there you go. I didn't. Yeah. Know yeah. <laughs> well, but my point is, he, he addresses this in the book where you know about the quote unquote moral majority and religious right, and he says, "Look, if if you think we're wrong and can do this better, then do it better. Do it. Do it right. You know. But right now, we have an open window and." the humanist materialistic ideology that's sweeping this country is not true. It's not true truth. And if we care about our, our neighbors, even non-Christian peoples, uh, this worldview that's being furthered in the country leads to much misery and destruction. And of course it was Roe versus Wade that woke him up and there were talks of euthanasia and, 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 and the conquest of science. And, you know, dare we use the word prophetic? He talked about a technocratic elite taking over the country and and the sciences and the courts doing uh, sociological law. You know, in other words, not not following the letter of the law, but what they think is best for society. And we, here we are, fast forward forty years later. That's exactly what what is what is going on. And so all all that that that's a long apology for guys that are associated with the moral majority or the religious right saying it was a tumultuous time in the country. And I'm not sure they were wrong. I think, I think what happened is what you just said. If at any point they lost the central focus of the gospel, well, that's why it became, you know, maybe that's, so today you don't hear people talking about the religious right and the moral majority. You hear like Christian nationalism is the new, uh, the new new bugaboo word and, Right. And so, uh, well, and I think Schaefer, one of his statements in that message that you mentioned that he delivered at Coral Ridge, that, that is the great warning is he said it twice. He said, just remember a conservative humanism is no better than a liberal humanism. Amen. And he tried to emphasize that and say, you know, again, if you lose Christ at the center of everything, you've totally missed the boat. And that, I think, is, you know, a lot of times we want the fruit without the root, and Mm -hmm. it just doesn't last. Yes. Well, so let's turn the corner now a little bit into what you're you're doing, because I didn't realize, I mean, you've worked with uh, Piper. I don't know. Did you say Moeller, too? So what? No. (laughs) Okay. Yeah, after after Coral Ridge, um, I went up to work for Christian Media Agency and uh, and work with a quite a, a collection from across the spectrum. Um, actually, the next co-hosting that I did, and uh, I was still the voice on Coral Ridge, but I began working with uh, the former Methodist pastor John Maxwell, who's known for his leadership books. Really? Okay. And you talk about a complete different, you know, Jim Kennedy, John Maxwell, totally different personalities. And uh, and you know, one of the fun things, here's one of the fun behind the scene things. The producers of that show, I was just, just the co-host. I was just on the air. I didn't write. I didn't produce. I was just, you know, the talent, if you will. But um, 
So both the scriptwriter and Maxwell, of course, are Arminian to the core. And the scripts would always be, you know, that they were written in such a way that I was kind of leading into all that. And I would on the fly, I would reword questions and different things so that I wasn't affirming what he believes and I don't believe, but still giving him a chance. You know, it's his program. He's the one who's here. So, you know, out of respect and, uh, I guess I can do this. I mean, John's still with us. He wouldn't mind. But uh, one time we took a break after a couple hours of recording and, and, you know, he knew exactly what I was doing. He could tell because he saw the same script and he saw what I was changing and how I was doing it. And it was obvious, you know, he felt affirmed that I certainly wasn't twisting or not allowing him to be who he was and believe what he believed. But so we're standing in the break side by side. You can, you can assume what this is. And he goes, You know, Bob, it really is okay. Uh, You know, my name is John C. Maxwell. You know what the C is? And I said, no, I don't, John. He said, Calvin. John Calvin Maxwell. And that was where he was revealing, I know exactly what you're doing. And, you know, he made it funny funny at that point. So he he was just delightful because Kennedy was intense. I mean, he was very intense, very professional. Um, Another one of the things, you know, uh, people could take this the wrong way, but, you know, In scripture, we see all of God's heroes and each one of them had their good moments and their bad moments. There was one time when Kennedy peeled my skin off for about 10 or 15 minutes uh, for something that I had not done. I was following orders from ministry leadership that they had not cleared with him. And he assumed it was me taking uh, this action. So he just skinned me alive for, you know, and I was just like, just, just torn up. But I look back and I say, you know, that was just, you know, Kennedy being Kennedy. And and I've never just, you know, thought anything negative of him for that because I know I have more flaws than I could ever count. And so that was just a weak spot instead of, you know, and that was also a learning moment for me to say, if I'm ever sure that someone has done something that's wrong or, or against what I have, you know, wanted, always come in first and say, now help me understand what happened here rather than just launching in as if I do know. Um, that would have been the right way to handle it. He didn't do it. Um, the one benefit and another benefit of that is not only learning how to handle other people's mistakes and, and perceive rebellion, but the other thing is that it's like some of the luminaries today, and you know, when they want to dress me down, I'm like, baby, Jim Kennedy tore my skin off one time. You don't scare me at all. <laughs> you know, it's just like um, after that <laughs> thing, it's like nobody scares. It's like whatever, you know, you can accept me for who I am. Anyway, but after Maxwell. Well, hold um, on there. Hold on, hold on. So th- so on that story, because you're saying how you learned from that, ha- has that impacted your own shepherding? I mean, you're a ruling elder. Oh, I mean, like I say, it, I I can't say, and probably someone can, you know, after seeing this, say, hey, remember when. But usually it's I try and say, you know, help me understand. W- w- this is kind of what I'm seeing, but is that, am I misunderstanding or am I missing something? So that's just the important takeaway that I took from that was, you know, always be sure to clarify. Don't, if you don't know, if you're not firsthand witness to it clarify and make sure that you know the story because maybe there is something to correct and maybe there's a misunderstanding on your part that you need to correct something else um Uh, yeah i've I've found so often things can get reported to me and my mind will automatically jump to why they would do that what motives were there all this stuff and by the grace of God, I mean, earlier in my career, I, I, I didn't do this well. And I, I was in the corporate world, too, and um, there was more aggression there. <laughs> but like in the church, it was kind of like you have to start the way you just said. And then you get an explanation, and oftentimes it's not at all what I thought. And if there were hints of what I thought it was, I was in a position to more pastorally kind of handle it with them. But, yeah, it is it is easy on in our humanist, in our human side to think the worst of why somebody may do something, given w- even their history in that. So, um, but, yeah, go ahead, uh, Maxwell. So, yeah, I mean, and, and Maxwell, his, his program lasted all of about seven months. I think July 5th of the year that it started in January, it, it he pulled the plug and moved on to other things. Um, The next one was really interesting. I was uh, playing a backseat producer role as we began to work with uh, John Piper and Desiring God. And um, I had gotten 
Piper's book, The Pleasures of God, when I was producing down at Coral Ridge. I knew nothing about him. And for some reason, I picked up The Pleasures of God and read it at one point, And it just captured me. I loved, uh, you know, that's actually my favorite of his trilogy. He's written, you know, dozens. But um, The Pleasures is still um, God's joy in being God. And I ended up actually teaching a Wednesday night series at Coral Ridge um, on that and what makes God happy. It was the, the abuse title I gave it. But uh, so I got a chance. Our, our uh, the agency I worked for began to work with Desiring God to prepare them for a radio ministry, and there was someone on staff up there at Bethlehem Baptist that I was working with to be the co-host, and I was kind of, in my experience and stuff, helping him to understand the role. And at some point, he just said, "I can't do this before we launched," and so then they came to me and they approached, said, "Well, would you do this?" And I mean. Hopefully in the positive sense, you know, I pretty much idolized Piper at that point. You know, his theology was just so – every time I read it, I wasn't going, boy, John Piper's awesome. I was going, oh, I want to know Jesus like this. What I year was this? I him like this. Um, would have been probably about 1998, I'm going to guess, somewhere in late 90s um, was yeah, And that's right on the precipice of him getting very big. Um, yeah, and and so I mean, and, and the radio program with him lasted for I think about seven and a half, eight years, um, oh. and so. But the 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 my favorite story though is when they came and they said, you know, well, would you do this? And I mean, I just I was kind of like Gandalf when Frodo's offering. Their, it's like, don't offer me this, don't <laughs> offer me this. This is just like too much. And mm. uh, but I got I got to work with him for seven and a half years and. And it's just such a great privilege because, you know, I mean, and I see people criticize him. And, you know, we, we've all got our flaws. I mean, come on, guys. But the one thing about it, um, John Piper was John Piper um, off mic, on mic, in his house, in his church. He was the same guy everywhere. His integrity was impeccable. And the funny thing, too, was that uh, the first weekend that I went up before we launched the radio show, they wanted me to come up and spend the weekend and go to church at Bethlehem. And then they said, oh, and after service, you're going to come home with John for lunch. And I'm like going, really? I was with Kennedy in South Florida for eight years. I don't even know where he lives. It's somewhere over on the canal somewhere. But I mean, I you know, I did not have that kind of access. And so first time I'm meeting Piper, it's in his house at his kitchen table with Noel and his daughter Talitha. And I mean, it was just like, Total culture shock from uh, from being with Kennedy. But again, I mean, you look at it, you say God calls all kinds of different people who have all kinds of different temperaments and all kinds of different ways to do it. And at all of them, you can find amazing beauty and see how the spirits at work. But that was uh, that was a very treasured time that I wish could have gone on forever because it bet. was just, it was amazing. great. That's amazing. And I I. Uh... I love Piper and his work. I understand the theological concerns that, that some express, but I'm I'm just uh, he he has a passion for the Lord and yeah. and, uh, and to be on fire for Christ. And he you know is the whole seashell story thing you know, but just ignited yeah. a generation to want to pursue Christ. It, it's a it's a beautiful thing. And so I think and here's we can, the thing I, I I just always had you know it's like guys okay you know what so you think he's got a few theological problems. Guess how many you've got? You know, we're going to get to eternity and then the Lord's going to say, yeah, you, you got this right. And here's where you missed it for every one of us. So, right. you know, Romans 14, be convinced, but be careful about judging or condemning people because you know what? He said, be convinced even to the guys that were wrong in that chapter. And that, that drives me nuts because like, shouldn't he be saying get right? Well, no, he's saying, you know what? You're human. You're going to get some things wrong. <laughs> Hold things, make sure that you say that truth matters, but do it in humility to know that you're an imperfect man who's going to get some things wrong. And so, yeah. well, I, I anticipate we're going to get comments on, on this because there are some that are very fierce against uh, his view of how works figure into things and all, and all this other stuff. But anyway, uh, and not to say it's not <laughs> important. It but, is a very important. I mean, but yeah. the other thing is, too, one of the things that I really respected about him, he got a lot of flack. For example, going back a few years, he would invite people that were kind of persona non grata to his conferences to present that had some very significant theological differences. 
And, you know, people really criticized him. And some of those were in the years that I was working with them. But what they didn't know was that back in the green room and in the dinners during the conference, he was digging deep with those guys on those issues. He would give them a platform on things where there was agreement between them. And then, you know, who else could address guys of that stature on the things that were seen as errors except someone that they respected? And so in a way, again, he was earning the right to be heard by inviting them to speak on the conference on something there was agreement. But then he was really doing the hard labor of addressing things that he thought were dangerous or wrong behind the scenes. And again, it's like, okay, can we do that instead of attacking each other on social media, instead of running to our blogs and our podcasts to show how smart and right we are? You know, what are we doing to actually contact that guy and say, hey, let's sit down and talk about this because this is important. Yeah, I, I I think we haven't figured out as a as a people how to how to process like being able to unite with people, co labor with people, and and have differences, and and what the boundary of those differences is. You know, I remember it was a big deal yeah. when he had Rick when he when he did yep. some stuff with Rick, Rick Warren, Warren and Doug and Wilson. Of course now, yeah. Oh, did he do that with the? He oh, had yeah, that one yeah. of his conferences too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. but those I, are specifically the ones that are in my mind too. That, yeah, me that too, were at yeah. the time I was there, and it's like, you know, I understood some of the hesitation, but it was kind of like uh, Kennedy always being on TBN. He got a lot of flack for that. Sure. And yet, again, it was he was basically saying, "Look, if they'll allow me to teach a more pure gospel." In this context where people are, you know, and you can disagree with him on that, but that was his motive was to get the gospel to as many places as he could. So, again, with Piper, what was his motive? It was to try and have an impact on these places where there were error by talking to the guy face to face. How do you think, I, I, not that you're going to be able to speak for him, but, you know, at the time when he was when he did that with Doug Wilson and with with Rick Warren, they weren't exhibiting the aberrations, their their theological aberrations that they are today. So how do you think Piper would view it today in hindsight? You know, I think Piper is just focused on Jesus and using his gifts. You know, they, he does what he can, and yeah. the rest he has to leave to God's sovereign care. I mean, we all wish we could change the world in that way and have an influence. And and he tried in some ways he with tried. these guys. Yeah. And, you know, but at some point, too, you have to let it go and just say, Lord, I'm not God. You are. And so, you know, I hope you used what I said faithfully. And uh, that's all I can do is use the gifts and the opportunities you give me. And beyond that, it's in your hands. You have to do what's yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, fast forward to today. You, uh, what do you do with NRB TV? What is it, and what other projects are you doing? Um, the best way, and for those who haven't heard of it, um, basically, I had always had this uh, kind of a dream in the back of my head, being that I started off in newspapers, writing in Southern California, the OC Register, LA Times, all that. I was in sports, sports writing, and things like that, and that was my love. I was not a, I was not following Christ at that time, but I had this dream of being. Uh, newspapers, radio, TV. Well, I ended up going newspapers, TV, and then radio. And I was in radio for several decades. And then finally in 2010, I got to go back into television. But one of the dreams I'd always had when I was involved in radio, probably inspired by Kennedy and his worldview, was to be a part of something like a Christian PBS. And um, basically, in the around 2010, I began to work with NRB TV. It was in its uh, very early years at that point. But their vision was, and and the way I present it to people these days, I said, imagine a PBS or Discovery Channel got saved. That's NRB TV. That's what we want to be. And so it's an educational Christian channel. Um, it does have preaching and teaching, but mainly that Saturday evenings and all day Sunday. And then we have uh, Monday through Friday, we have what, what's called the uh, the Bible study block. It's in the weekday mornings, and that'll be people like uh, Saturday and Sunday, more like pulpit ministries typically. And then the weekday mornings are more of the in-studio type shows. So, for example, we have Ligonier's, you know, Renewing Your Mind, Sproul stuff in that block. Um, but then we have all kinds of, you know, it's news, it's lifestyle, it's exercise, it's art. It's, uh, you know, everything you would probably find on PBS 
it, we have that from a Christian worldview. So we work with all kinds of producers. There never really was an outlet for the kind of things they do in broadcast television. And so that's, that's what NRB TV has tried to be. It's broadly evangelical. The thing is, I am the chief theological reviewer for any program that comes to us. So it's like I say, okay, what's your statement of faith? Who would you compare yourself to? And I'm sure I've turned down a lot more than I've accepted as far as ministry. Doesn't mean we're perfect. Doesn't mean that, uh, you know, there aren't some on there that I had to work for years to try and get off there that were there before I arrived. But, uh, you know, so that's what we're trying to be. And we are appreciated. One of the ways uh, uh, I ex- demonstrate to people like us the appreciation is john MacArthur said he would never do christian tv because of what christian tv was well john's been on with us for well over a decade with a weekly uh pulpit program so, so wait, but wait, where do they where would somebody because i want our listeners to know how sure. to access it how are we going to access this um well it started off where uh, the main outlet was satellite direct tv but since then, we've expanded We in limited markets, and you can go to nrbtv.org and look up where it's released here in the U.S. We do have local broadcast stations. We do have some um, cable systems. The main distribution these days is all the different streaming services. So the Rokus, the Amazon Fire Sticks, the, uh, you know, uh, boy, I'm just losing it here, but Google TV, Apple TV. If you go to any of those app stores and search NRB TV, you will probably find our free app in there and it's free to download free to watch um and then it's distributed in in those kind of ways uh, we were going to be a u.s network that was the plan at the start but very early on god said no i got bigger plans and all of a sudden we had cable systems in africa we had outlets in europe and australia and new zealand um I guess I can say, I mean, we, we found out to the only producer of apps for smart TVs in China. We're in that app store. So um, people can get our signal litter. And in fact, early on, too, when we were just streaming over the Internet, which we still do, but uh, our our distributor at that time was out of Canada. And the Middle East tended to block a lot of networks out of the U.S., but since we were coming out of Canada, we were getting numbers in Israel and Jordan and Saudi Arabia and Iran. And there were people watching our network, which it, it's an English network, but they were watching it um, in literally all around the world. And some of my favorite um, letters that I've gotten have been like missionaries on the field and in, in nowhere in South America. But they are able to watch us there and they say, you're my food as I'm ministering to these people in this ground. Those are my favorite stories. So basically anywhere in the world that you can get um, Internet, you can get us either through the direct feed or through an app. So it's pro. So it, but it's it's kind of run like a like a TV channel. So there's time slots, kind of like yeah, twenty four seven, yeah. But my point is, it's not like it. It's not like watching some pre recorded. Well, they are pre recorded, but it, it's not on demand, right? You're watching a right. program. It's a twenty four seven network, so we have a, a a clock all day long that's running different programs. Now, the one thing that the the uh, app-based systems do give us, and, and we have them for the tablets and Android and Google phones and all that stuff too, but the, when you're on an app-based system, when you go on, you can choose between, are, am I watching the live network or on all the app-based systems, you have access to a free seven-day archive. And so if you missed a documentary on Thursday night that you really wanted to see, you've got a week to go back and watch that on demand. So... Uh, most of our content is like that. There's some, there's a very limited handful of programs we we don't have an agreement to run on demand, but uh, many of those we do. So, yep, that's cool. our well, website. I just pulled it up. <laughs> yeah, if any, if, yeah, if people are watching on YouTube, you got children's programs, kids Bible Zone. Uh, very cool. What, let's see what's live right now. Yeah, and the biggest thing I would say too is that uh, you know there are a lot of people because the the price point for producing good content is has come way down and so there are a lot mm. of people producing content for uh online that uh i would just appeal to you and say you know if you're a good producer of reform content for a certain segment whether it's apologetics whether it's children's whether it's lifestyle um contact nrb tv and let's talk about whether we might become an outlet for you because we don't produce any programming well, I won't I not. We have not produced much programming on our own. Most of it is we're working with producers of content. So um, 
like some of the documentarians that have done stuff that was for the DVD market and all, we've given them a broadcast outlet that's willing to do their stuff. And we've got relationships with somewhere around 10 to 12 seminaries around the country where we air sometimes their chapel services, sometimes class material. Um, Saturday, it used to be noon to six. I don't know if it's still, but it might still be about that time frame. But so... You know, also, too, I'd love, you know, good seminaries, Greenville, RTS, somebody. If you've got content, let's talk. Well, wait a minute. You know, you know, I'm I'm a promoter of of uh, BTS, Birmingham Theological yeah. Seminary out of Briarwood. And, and I know Ike is uh, he definitely is on the front lines of a lot of a lot of new ways to deliver content. So I yeah. will talk to him. Let's talk to him. Uh, so, but do you have like where where can I find a TV guide? Is there such a thing? As a TV uh, it is guide on guide? there somewhere. I'd have to put my glasses on to tell you where it is. But it, I know it's on there. That's like the schedule. I think maybe on the bottom or go to the bottom of the thing here and well, look see at all the grace there. to you. Uh, there's there's Mac. Yeah, like I said, you know Johnny you got Mac. It all. I'll never do Christian TV. Well, there he is. Uh, I know on some somewhere on there. I mean, I mean, you can see the individual programs, but there is a right. schedule somewhere on there. <laughs> so here it says, yeah, I, I hear it says Direct TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV at least. So there's a number of ways you guys can can get this, and uh, all the shows. Well, this, so I wonder if I click a show, what it'll like? Is it going to tell me when it is? Yeah, I'm sure if you go down there, it better, or I'm going to be in trouble. T yeah. show schedule. T show schedule. There you go. Oh, different! Wow, look at that. Okay, but we we got to there. There's there's got to be a way to have a TV guide. So I don't know how we'll find that. But oh, maybe here full schedule. There it is, full schedule. I knew it was on there somewhere. Wow, there you go. Wow, look, it's like a TV guide the way it used to be. <laughs> Almost, yeah. All kinds of stuff. <laughs> oh, look at that. And obviously on Direct TV, you can go to the the TV guide on that and see the schedule there. And uh, you know, but this is a way on the web to find out what's on when. And again, if you uh, if you're watching on an app based system, for example, at home, I, I have Roku, and so that's how I get my TV content. Um, and if you miss something, a documentary or something we're airing, um, for example, I think it's what is today? I think it's tomorrow. We start a new series um, that was originally produced by Focus on the Family. Uh, it's called True You. And uh, I was really impressed. Oh, yeah. I've seen I've seen Stephen Meyer in a lot of different mm -hmm. contexts, but they put him in a college classroom with a bunch of really smart college kids. And it was magic. I mean, it was just, I got to produce that for broadcast. And uh, I, like I said, I think it starts airing tomorrow. The first of the, uh, is there evidence for God? And it's more of a science based. And then he went on 10 uh, episodes on uh, is there evidence for the Bible and and went through archaeology different things. Bad I, yeah, I've, it is great. I've I've taught both of those actually. I have the I have the DVDs for one of them. Yeah, the first one was does God exist, and the next one is uh, something about scripture being yeah. reliable. And it's yeah, it's uh, it's empowering. It's fascinating. Yeah, cool. That's that's and that's the hear. kind of stuff we love to do. And uh, you know, and even on the other end of the spectrum, you know, some of the things we've done, you know, we've done two-hour debates on eschatology, which most TV networks will not touch. But that's the kind of thing as a kind of a PBS uh, type station occasionally will do stuff like that. So, you know, again, if, you, if you're a content producer or content owner and a broadcast outlet sounds interesting, I mean, go to the nrbtv.org and make contact with us because we'd love to talk to you. That's great. Well, I hope I hope some people do. This is this has been a, a great conversation. Oh, and so, if you're a church, you know, um, I'd love to have a PCA flagship that's like this is what reformed worship looks like, and you know, so hopefully you can find someone like that too. Bob, this is going to happen as a result of this. I'm not saying <laughs> I, have a lot of I, I don't have a lot of viewers or listeners, but but there's enough here that I mean that's that's going to be that's definitely going to happen. I mean. Yeah. Okay. I, I have some ideas, but I don't want to put them out. I don't want to put them out there for you publicly because I don't want to put people on the spot. But so, well, that's great. Where Where do you see, as you've seen, as we start to wrap up, have you, as you've seen media and you said you want to be, uh, what was it, print, TV and radio or something? Is well, that, that was my personal, before I was a believer, my lifetime goals were newspaper, radio, television. That was kind of how I saw things. Um, you know, the interesting thing is that uh, in the first couple of years after the Lord called me, um, the few things that had not been checked off on my bucket list, he kept giving me. 
And literally within a couple of years, I I finally had I did a championship football game on radio in Southern California as play by play. And that had always been a dream. I'd done them on TV and I got to do one there. And it was like I remember sitting down that night and just saying, Lord, I, I gave all this up. I said, you know, when you brought me to yourself and showed me how precious you are, I don't need all that stuff anymore. And you still gave me everything. And I'm like, now you've given me the last thing I ever wanted to do. I don't know what this means, but I'm still just like, what do you want from me? Where do you want to mm. send me? What do you want to do? And he sent me to South Florida, which I hate flatland and heat and sweating and beaches, but you know, it was okay. Tropical, beautiful yeah. weather. Yeah. <laughs> Look at you. <laughs> but uh, I'm glad I'm some people Florida like it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, well, again, this is a, a, a podcast with ruling elders for ruling elders. So some of the takeaways are, uh, of this of this discussion, I think, are um, just some great insights from you talk about a flagship of the church. But, uh, uh, man, I love your focus on Kennedy's just heart and passion to spread the gospel. I yeah. loved how, you know, I mean, we're so ruling elders and teaching elders alike are shepherds. And how are we? Uh, shepherding our congregation to evangelize. That's one of the biggest critiques I've heard in the two churches that I've had is that people just, well, we don't know how to share our faith. And um, it, it seems to me you can't do that without going out and sharing your faith. And so yeah. we, we've taught so many evangelism and, and apologetics classes, but unless somebody's willing to have a conversation, and but that needs to be modeled. And, and TEs and REs, we, gotta, we have to kind of model that. Um, and then just technology, I think, you know, in our own day and, and, you know, 2020 forced sort of every church to kind of get into the techn technologically, uh, to be technologically savvy. And, um, a lot of, a lot of churches are streaming services still. We, we stopped actually, Bob, we, we stopped streaming in 2021 because we just said, this isn't, this not corporate worship. And there's a lot yeah. of better thing people can watch. They, if they want to watch, if you want to watch worship and you, you, you're you not at Meadowview, you can't come to Meadowview, go to NRB TV. I'm sure they got something <laughs> on there for you to watch. But, uh, you know, I always say that you could watch, if you could watch, you know, John MacArthur or John Piper or in, in the PCA, you know, Harry Reader or uh, Kevin DeYoung, like, if you if that's your view of church, why are you watching us, you know? Yeah, KDY, uh, if but, you want to do TV, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yes. Yeah. Um, so, but of course, I understand churches are doing it because they say, you know, for their homebound members or, or people that can't come. And so every session is going to make those decisions, no doubt. But um, technology, churches are using technology in, in in really good ways, innovative ways. And and you're you're a part of that. In uh, you, you have been a part of that your whole career. And that's awesome. Um, so where do you see it all going, Bob? Do you? You know, I'm not smart enough to know. I mean, I, this I know, though. Every time we hear about, oh, you know, this is going to be the death of radio. This is going to be the death of TV. It never is. I mean, it just new things get added. Um, unfortunately, we're, it, it's more and more fracturing. You get these micro constituencies out there, which can lead toward a hardening of, uh, you know, all they hear is this one tiny view that may be a little bit hardened and and all of a sudden you know we have trouble talking to each other anymore so that's a little bit of a fear of the the balkanization of our media choices um but the bottom line is you know what are you called to do go go do it um video is such a major communications medium it's always going to be and so you know, what is it your church could do? What talents are in your congregation that could produce something that is compelling and can help draw people a little bit closer to Jesus? One more link in the chain. Ah, great. You always bring it back to Christ. I love that about you, Bob. What, uh, what, what how has this, has your background helped you in your, in your role as shepherd elder uh has it has it been utilized on your session at all and, and if, if not that's fine but just curious like how you've seen the overlap of how god has gifted you in the world uh in in your calling in the church i think probably the biggest personal impact has just been that i've gotten <laughs> i've literally gotten paid for decade after decade after decade to listen to the best preachers of our time. Wow. And so, um, for example, I mean, it, I didn't used to be a very good just speaker 
back and forth like we've done in this last hour. I mean, I listen to this and go, man, this is so different. I used to have to have a script and that was how I did everything. I wanted to write down. And when I started exhorting, I can't say preaching on this broadcast. I get in trouble with some people. So when I started exhorting, I always had manuscripts word for word. And, uh, and there's nothing wrong with that, but I've felt the freedom sometimes now to go with much less, you know, just an outline or things like that and been able to actually see the Lord carry it through. So I think one of the benefits is just soaking in these great communicators has helped me to be able to more powerfully communicate the gospel in my own one-on-one -on -one ministry and church ministry in the pulpit. Praise God. I, I love that you just said that because it is true, like communication, the gospel is is communicated, you know, and so we do need to work on our communication skills. I, I found that myself even with, uh, by the way, by doing this podcast, the, uh, I don't know that I'm the greatest uh, communicator or speaker, but it has helped me to have, mm -hmm. to do more teaching more, more loosely. Mm -hmm. But I, you know, I'll say the same thing with the preaching. I'm a senior pastor now for about four years, but, and so I'm preaching weekly. But before that I was a manuscript preacher but the more you practice and the more you do it and the more you feel comfortable in front of people, the more I've been able to go off script and the more that I, I go in now with two pages of note, two, two fronts of notes and then some scripture references that I can access pretty easily. And uh, so, yeah, the communication piece, I love that because one of the qual you talked about qualifications for elders earlier is apt to teach. You know, yeah. so it, it's it's not that we want to, you know, be up there bumbling around. Um, you know, when Paul says, I didn't come to you with, you know, uh, lofty words, words of wisdom. And, yeah, know, right. Words of wisdom. But he's not saying that he didn't work on his te his being being able to present and teach. And now I'm bumbling. But whatever you get. The, yeah. You get well, you learn also. I mean, a after enough of it, I mean, and you go in and you still have desperation. Um, yes. But you've learned that, okay, Lord, take this fear away because I know you've done it before and you love these people more than I do. And so help me to just trust you to do it again. And, uh, you know, never lose sight of that. I mean, we are not just professional orators. No. We are delivering the words of life. And there is no one who wants those words of life to hit home more than the one who's enlivening us to do it. So it, it, you know, it's a measure. Yeah, we work our tails off to make sure we're we understand the text and what it meant originally, and and how it applied to them, and how it applies now to us. But in the end, we're just saying, okay, Lord, help me to communicate this, because Jesus too. I mean, it's like a, a lot of guys they have the the proposition and the theological categories and all those very important things, but then you have to bring it down to the kitchen table and share it with people who don't live in those categories. You don't want to betray any of that, but you want to communicate. And so that's where the stories come in. And we see, you know, I mean, Jesus always used parables and stories, things to go, oh yeah, I understand that. And then he'd say, well, this is how God is. And so that that's the part I try and work in for me. And when I communicate with other pastors too, that may be really, really gifted on the technical side is maybe to help them a little bit more with the presentation to bring it into the kitchen table. That that's awesome because I think there's a habit in our own tradition in trying to protect what a sermon is and what the preaching of the word is and and what being exegetical is and not adding to the text and amen I'm amen to all that but Jesus' primary teaching methodology was through stories and mm -hmm. that's where illustration and application come in in a sermon which are you know there's but I think I think uh, in the reformed world we tend to be heavy on explanation. And, tr and lighter on application and, and um, illustration, you know. Yeah. And so, uh, well, well, good. This has been a great conversation. You you definitely have a radio and a TV voice, Bob. <laughs> and so I, <laughs> if you could think of other things we could talk about, let me know because this this felt very effortless, and I can you have a deep bank to draw from. I loved hearing your story, so thank you. Well, I'm gonna say it's very very nerve wracking because I'm used to being on the other side, actually. The funny thing is the first interview I did was last week with a, a, a guy who was a friend of mine in high school and we, neither of us was believers at the time. And it was a very, we were both in very toxic situations, both uh, going through sexual abuse and different things. And so, it, you know, that was the first foray into this. And I just sit here and go, look, it's like I tell my pastor, Kenny, I said, look, I'm just, I'm a tool in your belt. 
whenever you think I'm useful, pull me out and use me. But I, I don't put myself forward very much because it's just like, you know, I'll let somebody else tell me. I think you're called to do that. Okay, I'll go do that. So if you no, want to call me up again, call me up again. Yeah. Well, you just you just you just dropped like five things I want to talk about. So we're gonna have to have you on again. So I didn't I didn't know about the abuse part. Um and then when you said Pastor Kenny, you're talking about Kenny Silva? Is that Yeah. I didn't know he's your pastor. I guess I should have known yeah. that at this point. Well, this is great. Okay. Well, we we are at time, so I'm, we're going to have another conversation about we'll figure out something to talk about. I, this was great. Again, thank you, Bob, and I uh, hope everybody enjoyed listening to the Presbyterian and Reformed Churchman. Thank you, Jordan.